Welcome to the show. I'm Chris Smiley. Um, lucky to have a guest with me today, Will Griffin. Uh, he's coming to us from Georgia. Will is a United mm -hmm. States Army veteran. He was deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, nowadays, he is a peace activist. He is the creator of the Peace Report, which is a multimedia uh, social uh, network where you can find some of his uh, videos and commentary on YouTube, Facebook. Uh, Will, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Chris. Good to be here. Great. Uh, how are we doing? Are we good on audio? Okay. So let me just pull this up here. Um, so, Will, uh, a lot of stuff in the news to talk about, and uh, but if you could first just uh, kind of introduce yourself, um, give us a little bit of background uh, to the audience. I joined the U.S. Army at, uh, in 2004, uh, and I was in the military for about five and a half years, where I was deployed to Iraq in 2006 and 2007, and then I deployed to Afghanistan in 2009-2010. Upon getting out in 2010, separating and becoming a civilian, uh, I had a lot of unanswered questions. Um, so during my whole service, I was pro-military, pro-America, pro-whatever-the-hell, American exceptionalism, right? I, that's, the, that's the life I grew up in. But, um, you know, experience, the experiences I had in Iraq and Afghanistan and in the, in the military in general, I had a lot of questions, and uh, it was hard for me to answer them. I was going through PTSD, I still am, moral injury, um, all that. And, uh, you know, after getting out of the military, I went to college. I found some answers there. Uh, but more generally, I, it led me to an organization called Veterans for Peace. And uh, they, has, they have helped answer a lot of my questions. They have helped, uh, helped me develop as a peace and anti-war activist. Um, and that's, that's what I do now today. Okay, awesome. I know, I know. Awesome. You don't have to come all the way from there. So, um, a lot of our audience uh, are Afghans, and they're listening to us in Afghanistan as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, your experience there, and uh, what do you think about the war now? So, um, so first, let me just say for the people of Afghanistan who are watching this, I am deeply sorry uh, for occupying your country both personally and as what my country is continually doing for the past 15, 16 years, um, interfering with your politics, interfering and occupying your land, killing your people. Just, I, I deeply apologize for that. Um, and as now, as being an anti-war and peace activist, I am trying deeply to end this war and end the occupation. So. Uh, your lives can go back to being peaceful and we want to support you in any way that we can uh, that involve non-military uh, interference. Um, but other than that, uh, I have to tell you, coming, being in America, uh, you know, traveling around the states, uh, most people, most general Americans, uh, Afghanistan is not their top priority. They don't know much about it. Many people don't even know that we're still at war in Afghanistan, which is a sad, sad thing to say. There's a huge disconnection between what's going on in Afghanistan now and what the American people have. And we have very little influence on how our government acts, especially when it comes to the U.S. foreign policy. Um, but that is something that Veterans for Peace and I myself with the Peace Report try to do is try to educate uh, Americans on the true cost of these wars, the Afghanistan war, the Iraq war, the bombing of several other countries in the Middle East, uh, our, our meddlings in Eastern Europe, uh, in, in the Asia Pacific, and so on and so forth around the globe. Um, 
so yeah, that's 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 where I'm at right now. Thank you. Well, I know uh, a lot of the viewers are really going to appreciate uh, that sentiment. Afghanistan has gone through absolute hell uh, over the past 15 years and prior to as well, just in the last half century of just continual warfare. Um, so that's what we try to speak out uh, against here on this network, on my show, on Sajia's show, is trying to bring awareness to this conflict, trying to bring uh, attention to uh, a peace process. Uh, something I wanted to bring up uh, in the news that I think we can relate to this subject is the uh, uh, ban from the, the Trump presidency on uh, immigration. And this is something we had talked about uh, earlier, you and I, about, okay, so what's, what's really going on? What is the real reasons uh, behind this ban? Uh, some were calling it a Muslim ban. There's a lot of fear mongering involved. Um, but when you look at it, the, the countries that are being banned, there's seven specific countries. So it's not all uh, Muslims, it's not all Muslim countries. Saudi Arabia is not on that list. The countries that are on this list are the countries that were uh, militarily attacking. Uh, we're talking about Yemen, Syria, Iraq. Um, so what I think this plays into is a, a demonization of the enemy. So we have to characterize these countries and the people coming from these countries as uh, dangerous, as our enemy, as evil. Um, because if you don't demonize the enemy, as you well know, being in the armed services, if you don't demonize the enemy, it's very hard to get people to accept the killing and the wars and the occupation of these peoples. So there is a famous uh, Marine Corps general named Smedley Butler, and he has a book, and his quote is worldwide famous, and it goes like this. War is a racket, right? And if you take into these, these seven countries that are banning people from entering the United States, as the Trump administration has uh, initiated, um, we have to look at it in a larger con uh, context, right? Why these specific countries? Yes, they're calling it a Muslim ban, but it's not necessarily a Muslim. I mean, it does target countries who are, uh, have religions that are mainly uh, uh, Islam religion right but more importantly business is more important here Trump is a businessman right um, and uh, ban he would ban countries from say the most uh, radical uh, version of Islam that there is in Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia is not on that list and but if you look at the seven countries that are banned doesn't have business interests in those countries. Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE, uh, and it's and oddly enough, Afghanistan is not on that list. Uh, so it, it's really it's it's really a uh, Muslim ban. Even though it's you know, the Islamophobic nature of this administration, uh, the racist, xenophobic bigotry that this administration is showing. Um, but it, but as as Smedley Butler said, war is a racket. We have to look at how international politics and business interests align and kind of support each other. Uh, there's something that's known as the revolving door, where uh, corporations and political leaders uh, switch back and forth, going from the private sector to the public sector. And uh, Trump is a huge example of that, that's exposing that. Not to mention, this isn't just a Trump administration problem. Uh, President Obama laid a lot of the foundation for Trump to initiate uh, these types of bans. Um, and it even goes back to Bush uh, when he started the global war on terror, which I like to call the global war on civilians. Uh, more civilians have been hurt through these wars in the past 15, 16 years. Uh, than, than military soldiers. Will, um, so this demonization of Islam, demonization of Muslims, uh, can you speak to your personal experiences uh, and how you experienced that in the army of uh, demonization of the enemy, demonization of Afghans? Yeah, so that's a huge uh, tactic in the military. Listen, we have to, I mean, not me, we, but the U.S. military and government has to spend billions upon billions of dollars training normal, everyday people to vilify 
uh, a so-called enemy. Uh, and it's, in, you know, in the military, we use terms like uh, sand nigger, towel head, uh, and much more severe terms that I don't even like to say anymore. But uh, it's just a way of psychologically training people to vilify the enemy. Because after all, if it's, it's much harder to kill somebody that you hate uh, and that you think is inferior uh, than it is someone you think who is a mother, a father, uh, who, is the, who has grandkids or whatnot. And um, the psychological training is something that the US military has perfected, absolutely, right? with the all volunteer military. Um, so it's something that they have to focus on, this psychological training that we go through in basic training, uh, the, the advanced individual training afterwards, uh, any other additional training, and then it's continued within the military culture uh, to keep telling us, reminding us, you are making the world a safer place. These people are not people, they're not humans, they're inferior, they're enemies and um, it, it just continues the cycle of violence and, and that's why the U.S. can keep spending uh, the massive amounts of money that they do every single year. Right, and, and you know, we see uh, that type of demonization that's very intensely uh, portrayed in the military, it's very strong here in America. I mean, when we look around and, and we see the rallying for support of warfare, when we see the domestic terrorism here in the United States and in North America, just uh, uh, recently we saw this uh, m mosque in Canada being attacked uh, brutally by a, uh, a right-wing uh, white uh, extremist. And so this is a very dangerous uh, concept. It's a very dangerous propaganda machine that we're dealing with. That you know not only is uh, pervaded in in the military, but here domestically, it's just a continual uh, circle uh, that we're seeing. I just want to say that uh, for the attacks in Canada on the mosque, mm. um, if that was an attack on, say, a Christian church, uh, you know, people all over the world on Facebook and Twitter right. would change their profile photos to a Canadian flag, right? Something mm. that we've yeah. seen with France and other countries. Uh, but that this happened to Muslims uh, who are Canadians, uh, this completely didn't happen. Uh, this shows the strong Western-dominated uh, uh, culture that uh, really is xenophobic in nature. It's, it's scared of uh, other religions, people of color. And, and speaking of people of color, in the U.S., uh, uh, people of color are completely vilified, dehumanized. Uh, they lack uh, opportunities. Uh, economic opportunities, political opportunities, um, and culturally they're just uh, looked at as, as some type of uh, something lesser of a human that shouldn't deserve the rights of, say, uh, either white Americans or male. Um, and, and our government kind of shows this, right? 80% of our Congress is uh, not only male, but white. Um, and just to throw a statistic out there, 51% of Americans are female. Right? This shows the very undemocratic nature of our government. Uh, obviously, there's more people of color in this country. There's, there's uh, more women in this country. Yet our Congress, our political leaders, uh, are dominated by white male people. Right? I'm not saying all white male people are, are, are bad people, but uh, they should recognize that they have more opportunities in this country than, say, another person that is either female or a person of color. Yeah, I mean, we really need to get real here in America and just own up to the fact that America has a race problem. I mean, this country was built on racism, it was built on slavery, and it's something that we are not even close to overcoming yet. I mean, the race relations problem we have in America is, is so evident, you know, not just with uh, African Americans, but as we're seeing here, this uh, anti uh, Islam, this, this Islamophobic problem is, this is the real. Uh, foundation that's able to carry these wars, these wars that are, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people being killed because of racism. A racism allows this to exist. So I just want to mention that we need an anti-war movement, whether in the U.S. or across the globe, we need to find the intersectionality 
uh, the interconnectedness of these issues and problems and social movements. Uh, for, for example, Veterans for Peace, an organization I'm a part of, uh, we have a campaign called Peace at Home, Peace Abroad, meaning that we cannot have peace at home unless we have peace overseas with our international affairs and vice versa. Uh, they're one in the same. Um, and really, if you see you know, America today with their militarized police forces, the police brutality uh, on all people of working class citizens, um, it shows the connection to US foreign policy, right? They get their equipment, uh, the police, the local police, state police get their equipment from uh, the military. They get their training from the military. Uh, a lot of their hatred comes from the dehumanization that we have in the military um, and vice versa. So it's a sick, uh, vicious cycle that keeps uh, perpetuating uh, endless war abroad and endless uh, brutality here at home. Um, also, I'd like to highlight um, a, a good, another good uh, example is uh, a boycott that's been initiated by Sean King, who is uh, you know, a prominent figure in the Black Lives Matter movement. He started what's called the Injustice Boycott. You can learn more about it at injusticeboycott.com. But he um, shows and is making these connections, this intersectionality that we need between uh, all people of color uh, here at home and, and the police uh, violence that's going on across the country and the political leaders and corporations that support these types of policies that hurt uh, black and brown people all across the globe. Um, but that's something to check out and just making, so my point is just to make the connection between U.S. foreign policy, domestic policy, uh, the intersectionalities of different types of, not just, you know, the anti-war movement, but uh, the civil rights and human rights movement, uh, the environmental movement, uh, the inter we're all fighting the same system. It's not necessarily coming from the Trump administration, even though they're the highlight of what's going on today right now because they're the ones in charge but this has been an ongoing process and I don't ever know of a time where America was great ever before yeah and this is something I've spoken about a number of times on my show trying to uh, relate to to the American public that and, and the world as a whole that what we have is a real systemic problem and this is something you discussed uh, with your peace report uh, show that what we have is a real systemic problem. People, especially, you know, you and I have talked about how we're really troubled by uh, uh, activists and the peace movement getting too caught up in the uh, problem of party politics where, you know, what we're really concerned about is people being drawn into this uh, debate. I mean, it's so pervasive. You turn on the TV and it's this massive uh, fight that's uh, portrayed of the left versus the right, Democrats versus Republican. This is you got to pick a side, get in on one side or the other. But what uh, you know, you and I have talked about uh, on our programs is that no, you know, both of these parties they serve the same interests. They're part of the problem, and that we need a real independent movement that's uh, genuinely true to social justice. There is a famous quote, and I'm not sure where the source uh, comes from, uh, but it's I think it's attributed to a, a Native American. But it goes like this. The left wing and the right wing belong to the same bird, right? And this hints at the fact that the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, uh, they all belong to the same system. They all serve the same interests. And a lot of the major issues, um, they're completely bipartisan on. They, they completely agree. There's no, there's no discussion to be had about the war in Afghanistan, about uh, bombing Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, whatever, what have you, um, uh, investing and um, sending more military aid and equipment and troops to the Asia Pacific or Eastern Europe. There's absolutely no discussion between these two parties, uh, which is I'm, which makes me a huge uh, advocate of having third party uh, discussions in there, third party candidates, just to widen the, the discussion um, and. Uh, on both sides, uh, the Republican and Democratic parties, they're, they're, they're all corporatists, right? They, there's huge ties uh, with, with businesses and corporations that have huge uh, untold influence on uh, the discussions that go on. It's, 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 it's a, there's a debate, but, but the spectrum of debate is very, very limited. And this is something that I think a lot of Americans, 
are uh, kind of waking up to and realizing, uh, kind of with the help of Bernie Sanders. Even though I, I, I like Bernie Sanders, but I just don't think he went far enough with his statement. It's much more uh, than just the 1% and versus 99%. Um, but I mean, over and over, we try to tell people that um, this is the huge problem that Americans need to face. And I think more people are starting to look at different options like the Green Party, uh, even the Libertarian Party, which I don't really agree with, um, but other parties like the Party for uh, Socialism and Liberation as well. Right. All right. So I'm going to turn to Facebook. We're getting a couple questions in here for you, Will. Um, so uh, Jamal says, what are the U.S. military failure factors in Afghanistan? Um, so something we talked about uh, yesterday is the current state of Afghanistan. Uh, you know, right now, uh, you can call the war a complete failure. I mean, we've been there for over 15 years. Uh, it's just continual bloodshed. The Taliban has significant control of the country. Uh, just for example, Helmand, where uh, one of the largest provinces in terms of territory in Afghanistan, uh, the government has lost uh, most control of that territory. Um, so the war itself, had, it, it, we have to admit, it's a failure. Um, but why it was a failure, what were the factors as it being a failure, uh, I think are pretty evident. I mean, we're talking about trying to control an entire country and, and accept a foreign occupation. I mean, this is something that is just not accepted by any sort of people. You're going to see resistance. And the Afghan people have shown over time, as with the Soviet occupation, that they're not willing to accept a foreign intervention. Um, well, I mean, you know, uh, the U.S. going into Afghanistan in 2001 uh, probably could have been a lot more successful if we didn't shift our focus to Iraq. Um, apparently, in the first year or two, the U.S. was uh, kind of uh, taking control and getting rid of so-called terrorists in, in the country. Uh, but then they shifted their attention to Iraq, spread their troops and military presence, um, which had a huge effect on Afghanistan. Um, and, um, you know, I don't think there's ever really been a successful fight uh, for an insurgency. Um, the Soviets couldn't do it. We're not doing it. Um, there's plenty of other examples in other places around the world throughout history. Uh, it's never really happened. It's it's and it's probably not going to happen. Um, with that being said, the U.S. is uh, not focused entirely on Afghanistan right now. Um, most Americans and political leaders are focused on, say, ISIS, um, and even other places uh, towards Russia and China and North Korea. Uh, that's why I keep mentioning Eastern Europe and Asia Pacific. Um, and a lot of our political leaders are just dumbfounded. They just don't know. Uh, Leon Panetta in 2012, who was the Secretary of Defense, uh, was asked uh, in 60 Minutes um, how many uh, engagements is the U.S. currently in, and he couldn't come up with a clear answer. And he kind of laughed about it and chuckled, "Ha ha ha! I don't. That's a good question," um, which sh really shows that our political leaders up to our Secretary of Defense and even the President, uh, just have no idea what to do and how to handle this situation. And Afghanistan has become the longest war that we've been engaged with, and they just don't know how to do it. And I think the reason is you can't, um, wars inevitably uh, do not come out successful. Uh, you know, fueling violence, uh, sending weapons, military aid to rebels, uh, We've been doing this for over 15 years. It's not working. Uh, that should be a hint that it's not going to work. Uh, a new strategy, which I kind of like, which kind of comes from uh, the nonviolence movement. Uh, how about the U.S. military start supporting nonviolent movements, uh, not only in Afghanistan but across across the world? Give them money, supply them with resources, highlight their stories on the media, uh, and. I, I'm, I'm a strong supporter of nonviolence, not because I'm, I'm pretty fucking sick of violence, um, but also that it, there's empirical evidence that shows a nonviolent resistance is much more successful, in fact, twice as much uh, more successful than a violent uh, uprising or resistant movement. 
Uh, this comes from Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan. Uh, they studied uh, nonviolent and violent revolutions from 1900 to 2006. Uh, over a hundred, or excuse me, 330 cases that they studied. And uh, nonviolent revolutions were twice as much uh, to be more successful than the violent uprisings. And if nonviolent resistance reached 3.5% uh, of the population or more, it was deemed successful every single time. And, uh, you know, these are hints that, you know, people in the anti war movement, nonviolence movement, need to start bringing up and uh, start urging our government, the US government, US military, to start focusing on nonviolent resistance because uh, apparently throughout history, that's what's worked. And, and the result after a nonviolent movement has, be, has ended in uh, more democratic institutions than say violent uh, uprisings. Yeah, I mean, a critical point. I mean, it shouldn't be too hard to understand that, hey, violence is wrong, violence never works, um, whether it's, you know, you're a citizen trying to rise up and change your government or whether you're the acting uh, government and trying to carry out some sort of policy. Um, you know, we've seen, uh, yeah. Well, I just want to, I, I want to bring that point up because there's empirical evidence to show that it's more successful mm. than the violent uprising. This isn't, you know, in, 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 in the U.S. we have a huge culture that kind of marginalizes say the hippies right they say oh mm. nonviolence, man like that's the way to go like you know it really yeah. gets made fun of right but no there's actual evidence throughout history historical evidence that shows that it's much more successful than violent revolutions and it ends in a more democratic uh institution yeah yeah there's this real uh problem with like machoism and this real spin of culture like you, you probably heard sometimes like people be like oh you bleeding heart liberal i'm like wait let, let's just look at that for a second so you're telling me that being empathetic and caring about other people is like weak or that like it's shameful to you know care about another human being so it's a real uh I, I don't get it will i don't get it <laughs> that's part of the two-party flip that we have right the republicans yeah. conservatives are always blaming the liberals and the democrats which, I mean, whenever those arguments are kind of said, um, I mean, I don't consider myself a, a conservative or a liberal. I don't, I'm definitely not a Democrat or a Republican. So whenever one right. person says something about the other, I kind of tend to agree with them. Um, uh, yeah. But uh, the, I, I'm not agreeing with them that when they say the other party, it's always the other party's fault, right? Um, on my Facebook page, uh, the Peace Report, who, who we just reached 25,000 likes today, which is awesome. I only started it four months ago, um, and I've reached millions and millions of people through my posts and, and videos or whatnot. But uh, let's remember, it's an anti-war page, right? I have a lot of Trump supporters on my page, believe it or mm. not. The Trump supporters, many of which uh, believe what Trump said, which is coming out to be untrue, about... Uh, hinting at being uh, an isolationist, sending our troops back home, bringing our troops back home, uh, not spending so much on bases overseas, uh, that whole nine. They really believe that. They wanted to mm. bring our troops home. And, and yeah. they, they look at the establishment and the Democratic Party as the, the, where they put their blame. Uh, and they think that Trump is going to come in and kind of save that. But my argument is that the Pentagon has no alliance to a political party and it usually right. wins uh, in influencing whatever administration is in power at whatever time. Yeah, I mean, I was real confused when people think that, uh, you know, the same thing, the same party in power, you're going to get a different result. I mean, we've already seen with uh, the Trump administration, the continuation of the warfare, there was just a catastrophic mission in uh, Yemen where, uh, let me bring up this picture. Uh, if, you, if you guys remember, uh, Anwar al-Awlaki, a United States citizen, targeted by a drone strike uh, by the Obama administration. His son was also then killed. His 16-year-old son, I believe, was also killed. And now his daughter, his, uh, I believe, eight-year-old daughter was killed in a drone strike. Or no, it wasn't a drone strike. It was a ground operation in, Ye in Yemen <clears throat> uh, where a number of civilians were killed. I think there's uh, estimates over 30 civilians killed, one uh, United States Navy SEAL. Um, so. I mean, what did that, what yeah, did we expect? Was, I think um, I think there was so it's so funny because different media outlets report different outcomes. CNN mm. says 
Uh, only 14 people were killed, uh, most of them being militants. Um, right. But then you have Reuters and the Intercept, Green, uh, Glenn Greenwald, uh, saying mm -hmm. that, hey, listen, it was uh, the 14 militants plus 10 civilians that included women and children. Uh, CNN right. forgot to highlight that moment or at least mention it uh, because the medics yeah. on the ground in that situation have reported that uh, 10 civilians were killed uh, and some of them were women and children as well. Yeah, I mean, big problem oh, with the United States. Thing. Sure. I just want to say that uh, this was the first bombing under the Trump administration, right? Um, yeah. And this shows that it doesn't matter if it's the Democratic Party with Obama or the Republican Party with uh, Donald Trump. Uh, it, it's a sign that's saying, hey, listen, we're going to continue bombing the Middle East. Uh, not to mention, we just recently had the Secretary, Secretary of Defense, uh, James Mad Dog Mattis, uh, go on his first trip abroad. And it wasn't, it wasn't to the Middle East. It wasn't to, to Europe where the refugee crisis is taking place as well. Uh, it was to the Asia Pacific, right? And this is a huge thing that I focus on today. Um, so General Mad Dog Mattis is, is visiting South Korea and Japan. Uh, this is part of what's known as the Asia Pivot, or they're trying to rename it the Asia Rebalance. Um, and this is something that was started in, under Obama's administration with Hillary Clinton. Uh, Obama announced the Asia Pivot in 2011. And this is, this is only going to hurt the Afghanistan people even more because it's shifting focus uh, to a, a completely different region of the world. Um, with the Asia pivot, 60% uh, of U.S. naval forces will be stationed in that region. Um, we're increasing military aid and equipment to places like South Korea, Japan, Guam, even down from, to Australia and New Zealand. Uh, this is more of a containment policy towards China and even Russia. Uh, they will use North Korea as a pretext, um, even though North Korea wants to disarm its nuclear weapons. It voted so in the UN um, and will sit down at the table this year in a few more months when the UN comes together to begin talks of nuclear disarmament. Um, guess what country voted against nuclear disarmament? The US. Um, mm. <laughs> Uh, so I just wanted to throw that in there because it's going to affect the Afghanistan people. Uh, less and less focus is going to be on Afghanistan, um, which uh, will give, uh, you know, it's an opportunity for people like me, anti-war activists, as well as the Afghanistan people to, to rise up, stand together, create movements to try to get attention and say, hey, listen, there's still a war going on here. Yeah, I mean, the United States is... Uh, spread out across the entire world. I mean, we've got an imperial nation. That's what we have, a colonizing imperial nation here. Uh, where we're just so spread out. I think you sent me a statistic, Will. What do we have? 800 military bases? Over 80 countries? Is that it? Yeah, so I just want to clear some of the confusion. Some people say 1,000 bases. Some people say 800 bases. My source is uh, Dr. David Vine, who is a professor of anthropology. He wrote a book called Base Nation. He's wrote several and several uh, articles over the past uh, several years about uh, military bases across the country. Um, and his conclusion is that there's 800 military bases around the world. Of course, people like uh, from the Pentagon or the Department of Defense will say that the number is much smaller. In fact, they say there's only 64 military bases around the world uh, because their definition of a military base is, uh, it comes down to annual costs. And they say any base that spends more than $900 million a year on one base, then that's considered a military base, uh, which is a huge, uh, a wrong way of looking at things because if, if there's soil that's taken away from another country then and, and military equipment or uh, personnel or station there then by my definition it's a military base not to mention uh, he so he says there's 800 military bases but there's also those bases are in 80 different countries around the world um, so that's the source that I get the information from it's academic it's scholarly um, so I think it's something that we can trust Mm. Yeah, I mean, real concern uh, for the people of the world. I mean, we've just seen uh, United States aggression affecting so many nations, uh, in Afghanistan included. And let me play a clip here that I wanted to play a few seconds ago. Uh, 
that Donald Trump gave uh, on Fox News while he was campaigning. I, I still don't know how he got elected saying things like this, but uh, real concern for uh, humanity as a whole when you have our president uh, that, that believes things like this. Let me play this clip. But we're fighting a very politically correct war. Yeah. Well, we see that the other thing is with the terrorists, you have to take out their families. When you get these terrorists, you have to take out their families. They, they care about their lives. Don't kid yourself. Mr. But they Trump. say they don't care about their lives. You have to take out their family. So uh, I don't know if you could hear that, Will, but that was Trump. Uh, the clip, him uh, saying that when it comes to terrorists, you have to take out their families. Uh, he said that yeah, like I'm five times. Which yeah. is, uh, you know what, there, there are a lot of Americans that believe that. Mm -hmm. um, they are extremely xenophobic. A lot of Americans haven't traveled outside of the country. They don't hang out with other types of groups, you know, different people of color, uh, different economic classes, uh, so on and so forth. So Trump is, um, is kind of... Uh, just exposing that portion of America. Uh, not to mention, he doesn't believe in climate change. He has his own alternative facts, uh, which is a huge part of American problem as well. I think it's something like 40% of Americans don't believe in climate change. Um, and, and it's just, it's ex all the hateful, uh, the Americans that are just full of hate and rage and are completely violent, whether they know it or not, um, are are being are coming out of the of the woodwork. They're coming out of the shadows. And Trump, being a political leader in the most powerful position in the world, um, makes people, average everyday people, uh, feel like they're empowered and they can go out and speak. That's why we're seeing the rise of the alt right, um, neo Nazi movements, uh, white nationalists, white supremacists. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also having effect in places like Europe. Uh, you know, there's signs in Spain that say, make Spain great again. Uh, in Germany, the neo-Nazis are coming out. Um, all, all over the world, Trump is, is empowering these people by having statements like the ones that you just showed. Yeah, this type of ideology fuels globalism. It fuels worldwide warfare. I mean, we're not, not just warfare, but you know, when you think about globalism, you're thinking about uh, allowing United States companies to abuse slave labor, extremely low wage labor, uh, which not only hurts, of course, those people there that are being abused, but American workers here that now no longer can't get jobs. So when you, this, this type of pervasive racism, I mean, affects so many aspects of our lives, uh, of the world as a whole. So this, this, to me, when you talk like that, it reminds me of uh, class warfare, class struggle, class conflict, whatever you want to say, but it's basically uh, the division, which I would argue the only division that matters in society is the division between the rich and the poor. You know, it goes back to the 1% versus 99%. Uh, the people at the top just don't care about um, average everyday Americans, and they sure as hell don't care about average day, uh, day uh, uh, average Afghanistans or anybody or, or South Koreans or what have you um, All right. their, their, their logic is to make money they think money makes the world go around uh, money is the new religion to them and uh, you know just you know they don't care about average working Americans so they're damn sure not going to care about average working Afghanistan Afghanis yeah um, well we'll we're running out questions? of questions let me check. I can check our Facebook feed. Um, let's see what we're getting here. Uh, somebody commented, America is using Islam as a vehicle to reach uh, Central Asia, which uh, definitely we agree with that. That's something we're seeing happen. Absolutely. Um, and Veterans for Peace and other organizations have created uh, as, uh, campaigns against Islamophobia. So there are people in America that are trying to say, hey, listen, not all Muslims are bad. It's not the religion. Um, and we're trying to stand up for your rights and trying to end these wars. Yeah. So before we close out, Will, I just wanted to, to have you just kind of express it to people, you know, what we're trying to get is a lot of people to change their minds to to, to develop a uh, concept and understanding of, of world peace. I mean, you know, you coming from uh, the United States military where you've got a lot of uh, 
closed-minded thinking, uh, a lot of just yes sir, no sir. How did you develop from uh, a United States soldier to to a peace activist? And how do you think other people might come to be more uh, enlightened? Or how can we convince others to be more accepting of uh, peace? Um, well, I consider myself extremely lucky being that uh, as of today, uh, 20 veterans, 20 ex-military personnel who become civilians uh, commit suicide. Uh, this is a huge internal moral conflict that we have with each other. Um, some of us make it through, um, some of us don't. I happen to be one that kind of made it through some of that process, although my experiences are nowhere near as severe as, say, an infantryman or some type of combat MOS. Remember, I just want to remind people that I was uh, what you would consider a common soldier. I wasn't a combat, I didn't have a combat job. Um, I wasn't infantry, I wasn't artillery. I was a mechanic. Um, but I still had friends die, uh, both in the wars and coming back home through the VA healthcare system. Um, and I know plenty of people who've had other friends uh, commit suicide or whatnot. But you know, years of having to deal with PTSD moral injury having antisocial behavior, um, you know, I, like it goes back to the very beginning of what I said earlier in this segment that I had a lot of unanswered questions and I was relentless in trying to find those questions. I've had really dark days, I still do now, um, but what really helps me get through is knowing that uh, I wanna help the people of Afghanistan. I wanna help the people of Iraq. I wanna help the people in Asia where all these military bases are, or in Eastern Europe, or in South America, or Africa. Um, and these opportunities really help me get through the day, help me get through the week. And this is a common thing you hear from uh, any prior ex-military personnel that's become an anti-war activist is that um, these types of things help me heal our soul and we kind of know for sure this time, we made a mistake before, but we know this time that we are uh, doing a better cause. Because listen, when people join the military, they think they are helping their country. They think they are uh, uh, serving the American people. Um, but I never realized what it was like to serve the American people until I went to Standing Rock. And I stood, instead of fighting for the corporations overseas, I was fighting against the corporations with the Native Americans and the environmentalists and the anti-war movement all in Standing Rock. And I uh, will continue this fight to this day. Well, Will, we really appreciate what you do as a peace activist. Uh, we appreciate you coming on the show. I'm just gonna show people. Uh, will, how can they find you? The Peace Report. Uh, you're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Yeah, uh, so if you just type in The Peace Report, either YouTube or Facebook, um, those are my most popular. Twitter is, is kind of lacking behind, but it's still there. So whichever you prefer, um, that's what I do. I travel the world now uh, fighting against this U.S. war machine, this empire. This I've become an anti-imperialist. And what I do is I try to film my experiences. I try to learn about the stories on the ground of the local people of, say, Okinawa or Jeju Island in South Korea or Standing Rock. And uh, I try, I, I, I make films about them and I try to expose it to the world. Um, I also use my Facebook page as an uh, anti war uh, news outlet, highlighting a lot of the injustices that um, are happening across the world and as well as home uh, with the police brutality that's going on. But if, if people want to, you know, join this revolution of peace, uh, they're more than welcome. Great. Well, I, I really enjoy following uh, the Peace Report. You put out a lot of great stories, uh, a lot of great videos. So please, everyone, check out the Peace Report. Uh, Will Griffin, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Sajia, again, thank you so much for allowing us to uh, be here on Afghanistan TV. Uh, and you can catch me next time. Uh, we've got Dr. Kamrani and Hassan Amiri coming up on Saturday. And you can always catch me here Thursday, 1 o'clock Pacific. Uh, we'll see you next time.